Hi, everybody. This is, uh, you know, it's, it always lingers on the first slide, so I thought I would put something that was, you know, some food for thought here. But this actually, it makes sense with my work because I'm always looking for, um, for opposites, for coexistence of opposites. Um, I use a lot of different materials and across a lot of disciplines, but I'm always looking for some kind of participation and investment from my viewer. And I try and embrace uh, this kind of coexistence of opposites in each piece, opposing forces. <coughs> so this first piece, I'm going to show you, this is pretty much chronological, and I'm going way back to 2001. This first piece is called Link Line. And there were um, only two components to this piece, which was a lot of thread and 93 volunteers. And um, the piece was in response to a show, a group show that was, uh, the show was in response to an arson of a synagogue in this town of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It was in the museum there in Harrisburg. And instead of making a piece within the museum, I started my piece in the museum, and then I, which was a piece of red thread, a single piece of red thread, and I ran it out of the museum four and a half miles um, through the town to a Jewish community center um, four and a half miles away. And on the route, I recruited um, people to care for this piece of thread. So I, I made some outreach visits, about um, four visits, the few months before the, before the show went up and recruited people. I went to a lot of parties and services and, um, you know, just met a lot of people and, and um, also did listserv stuff and put up ads and knocked on doors and places of business and got these people to agree to they signed a contract with me that they would tend the <coughs> thread in the event of breakage. And they all received um, a bit of thread, and um, they were to retie their section if it broke. <coughs> and this was um, about, for I can't remember, five or six weeks that the thread um, stayed up. And of course, it did break in places, but still the so it was kind of an intermittent thread. But the people in their um, vicinity did care for it. And I still look to this work as a guideline because of the way that it um, literalized, both literalized and created relationships between people. <coughs> and, um, the, uh, the material, I also still have strong interest in this piece because of the material-immaterial relationship, that the, that the material thing is, you know, nothing, but the immaterial thing is, is the thing, the, the, the relations, the emotion. Um, and this piece, uh, it was less of a thing than a cumulative experience, and this continues to be an aspiration in my work. Uh, this next piece is from 2003, and this is my first sound piece. It's called How Deep Is Your? And it also is a pathway and a cumulative experience that you can, so not one thing that you find, but it's something that you gather. And um, I'll just play this video. I might talk over it a little bit. Do you hear that? So this was in the gallery space. And there was an image that showed you you could do this. Put your head in the funnel. It's about that. And that, that's what you found in there. <laughs> That's what you found, and that's what you heard, something like that. And uh, my 
hopefully you were interested in it enough to follow it. And it led you, um, it led you out of the gallery and through the hallways, and it was a continuous tube, PVC and plastic, that occasionally became clear. And the clear points were, I call them sound leaks, and they were, they were sound leaks. Um, just perforations in the tube that allowed a little bit of sound to come out. And this idea of sound as a physical thing, but also ether. So I wanted you to not be able to see it, but, but to see where its path was. And the, um, this was at PS1 Museum, and all of the utility systems there are exposed. And so I used those as my guide to run this pathway. And I thought of it as an alternative utility system of um, sentiment rather than electricity or, or water. And it brought you eventually down to the basement where there's that big defunct boiler. And I used the two sides of the boiler and put one song in each side. Um, so one song was that uh, BG song from 1979, and the other song was this uh, John Lennon song from 1970. And those, uh, those were the kind of dates that framed my childhood. And the two songs would merge in that single tube, and that's what went through the museum. This is um, sound from the piece that you're hearing. So it was an overlay, and they would, d the, each one would dominate at different times. So um, that kind of idea of embodying the architecture or giving, uh, irrigating the architecture uh, was something that I used again in this next piece. And in this next piece, uh, so this was like my second really big sound piece. And it was, I was asked to do a piece in the stairwell of the Whitney Museum, and it's a uh, I used five floors of the space and made the space into a kind of instrument. And I, uh, the basis of the piece was this electrical cabinet that I found, like an empty electrical cabinet on the fourth floor. And I put this thing in there, which was a panel of eight speakers. And they were being fed from a computer uh, at the top of the building, eight channels of sound, eight distinct channels. And each of those channels would uh, feed into one of these pipes. And the pipes would bring the channels to different places in the stairwell. And each channel would come out at one of these ear funnels. So there was eight of these dispersed from the first floor to the fourth floor. And you could put your ear up to one of these funnels and hear um, one of the tracks that made up the composition. And as you walked through the stairwell, you would hear the entire composition because it was blasting loudly out of that cabinet. Um, so the composition, oh, there's an also this other part um, of optical moments in the pipes made with lenses and mirrors that would reflect people walking through. The composition itself was only voice, and it was, um, it was very, I started to get 
you know, I made that piece with the pop songs, and then I was very interested in sound as a conduit for emotion, and it seemed like the best way to explore that would be voice, human voice. Um, so this piece, I asked everybody I knew if they would, um, they would listen to Somewhere Over the Rainbow, the song Over the Rainbow from Wizard of Oz, and one line of text that Dorothy said from the movie right, Wizard of Oz right before she sang that, that they would listen to that on the headphones and then sing it themselves a cappella. So that it was um, a lot of friends, family, neighbors. I lived in Williamsburg at the time and um, I had a lot of international neighbors and I was looking for different kinds of voices. Um, I liked the reference of thinking about this uh, song that you'd encountered in childhood <coughs> first and then how you might think of it differently as an adult or the words have different meaning. Um, also thinking about this very iconic American song that, you know, how do you, how do you interpret that uh, if, you, you know, if you're from elsewhere. Okay. This is a this is a documentation I made of people interacting with the piece and also the sound from the piece, both the eight-channel composition and the individual tracks. Someday I will wish upon a star and wake up where there's the clouds are far behind me. Skies are blue and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Some place where there isn't any trouble. Do you suppose there is such a place, Toto? There must be. Where troubles melt like lemon drops away from the chimney tops. That's where you find me. There's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. piece that I wanted was the exchange of vulnerability that someone was these unprofessional voices were completely vulnerable singing that song and that you would meet their vulnerability with your own when you listen to their single voice. Uh, this next piece is called Can You Hear Me? Also from 2004 and this was um, an intervention. It was up for four months I believe or no uh, maybe it was up for a couple, 
I think it was up for the summer, maybe three months. And it was here, uh, the site of the new museum where the new museum is now. Just before they built that building, they commissioned some artists to do projects in the neighborhood. And we could choose our site. And I chose as my site um, this hotel, which bordered the site where the museum was going to be built. And it wasn't actually a hotel, um, as, as you understand a hotel. It's, uh, it was a single residence occupancy, no, single room occupancy, um, sometimes called a flop house. They, they, it was the Bowery area before um, it is what it is, before it was what it is now, was, had a lot of these SRO facilities where um, men could, uh, this was a men only facility, and men could live there for, uh, it was a $7 a night hotel, but really it was a permanent residence because the men who had been there, who were living there at the time, had been there from 12 to 30 years. Uh, the, the least recent, the one who had been there the least amount of time was 12 years, so it was really a permanent long term residence for them. And I thought that these were the, um, in the construction of that museum, these men would be highly impacted, <coughs> but it wasn't really being discussed. And um, I wanted to bring, <coughs> you know, to, to bring them into the conversation. And this was the object that I built, and I call it a device. And it was attached to the phone booth and um, went from the ground, the street level, up to, this is the, the signage I made to instruct how to use it. So it went from the street level where you could speak into it, and it, you can see it has a flap on it. It was open and closed at certain hours, and I um, worked with the men a few of the men in the facility uh, had, had the keys, and we discussed certain hours that it would be open. So it was open from 11 to 7 every day, and they would, these men would take turns opening it. And when it was open, you could speak into it from the street level, and your voice would be heard in the lobby area of the hotel. And this was the public area of the hotel. Uh, where the men could congregate. This wasn't the sleeping area, but it was really the, 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 er the only area there where they could congregate, read, smoke, hang out. And so there was often people in this area. And if you spoke from the street, your voice would be heard up here. And you could, um, you, someone who was up here might choose to answer you. And if they chose to answer you, then uh, they would go to the tube. And you could have a face-to-face -face conversation over that distance. Um, and the reason you could have a face-to-face -face conversation is because there were mirrors in the uh, mm -hmm. corners of the tube. So it was a periscope system that would transmit the image, you know, real-time live image of who you're speaking to, but it was reversed and um, very small. So you, the PVC carried the sound uh, very acutely, so you, you know, you heard the voice very loud as if someone's talking right in your ear, and then you saw the voice very distant, I mean, saw the, the face very distant, so you had a kind of simultaneous experience of proximity and distance. So I thought of this, um, I really thought of this as a, as a space, like this 30 feet of tubing <coughs> as a space between social dynamics, just a space to communicate with another person that was, was between. Um, Let's see, the, the power dynamics were a big part of this piece. And reversing the power dynamics, uh, the idea of these, you know, the men in that facility were not visible in, 
I mean, the, their invisibility uh, in the process of that museum being built, but also just in general, like these were not men who were used to being visible. And I felt like that exchange, that uh, the people on the street were the vulnerable people, and then they were in their comfort zone. They had the choice to answer or not answer. And um, so it felt like the, this device was something to move voices around, but also to move power around. And if uh, you called up and someone chose not to answer your voice, then you uh, saw the flowers that were there that I changed weekly. So um, this is a this is related work that's gallery-based work. And Can You Hear Me was uh, the, this kind of periscope system. These are optical periscopes to move vision around. Um, they are interactive. You look into them, and they give you a different experience of your own body and surroundings um, so that you have an experience of yourself looking. This one, um, you look and you can see yourself looking frontally, and then you see yourself also from the side. This one, you see yourself um, from above looking. This one, you um, see the space that you're in moving around with you looking um, in the middle of that space. So here where it's black is the camera, which would be your face. This next piece is called Elevator Music, and it was made in 2005, and um, I was, I don't know if you guys remember 2005, but I was very disillusioned. You know, it was the second Bush term, and we were deep in the Iraq War, and I, th my, I and many people were very disillusioned with um, the, that that th there didn't seem to be a potency in popular opinion. And um, so this was, let's see, I researched, I had kind of longing for the idealism of the 60s and 70s, and I researched peace anthems from that area, and then taught my computer to sing those, and that became the um, soundtrack for this piece. And also, uh, it was an elevator at a museum upstate, and I turned the, the elevator into a kind of social space. Think of your fellow man. Lend him a helping hand. Put a little love in your heart. You say it's getting late. Oh. Please don't hesitate. Put a little love in your heart. And the world will be a better place. And the world will be a better place. For you. For you. And me. And me. Just wait. Just wait. And see. And Jupiter aligns with Mars. Then peace will guide the planets. And love will stir the stars. This is the dawning, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. The age of Aquarius. Aquarius.
between my brothers and my sisters are uh, uh, all over this land. It's the hammer of justice. It's the bell of freedom. It's the sign of that love between my brothers and my sisters are uh, uh, all over this land. Next piece is from 2006, and um, it was a site-specific piece at the Tate Liverpool Museum, and it occurred in, actually, this is, this is nine, but it occurred in ten sites through the museum, and um, I used the fixtures. I had, to this point, I'd always been I'd been using sound with material, and there was always that interchange of um, the sound and the material that it that emitted it. And for this piece, I the material I used was actually the architecture. So um, I infiltrated the duct systems and also the plumbing, and so the sound would come out of the fixtures of the building, like the vents and also the drains, and then. Um, also, I used, and those were traditional speakers, and then I used some unusual speakers like transducers that would make uh, material uh, be speakers, so that I turned certain, certain fixtures into speakers, so that the door was a speaker, benches, things like that. And then ultrasound speakers, which were a kind of at that time, new technology that could send a very focused beam of sound, and um, and uh, you could walk into a kind of zone of sound, um, kind and it sort of sounded like you were putting on headphones, even though you didn't have any headphones. So uh, that was the kind of environment. So it was these these sort of voices that would pop out at you as you made your way through the building, all the way through the, um, you know, it was interspersed throughout the building. So the material that would pop out at you was um, voice, all human voices. These are some of the people that I recorded for this piece, not all of them. There was 72 people, um, all in all, and I recruited people uh, on the, I went on the radio in, in Liverpool, and I, um, you know, called for called for participants that way. I put some ads in the paper. The museum helped me do some outreach, um, and then I also did outreach here in New York and just sent kind of, you know, a big email blast to everyone I knew, saying, "Do you want to be recorded for this piece?" And whenever I uh, I started to do this thing that whenever I recorded people. I'd give them like a, a sound piece with their voice in it. But um, so I got all of these volunteers in New York and Liverpool. And this is, well, I asked them to do two things. I asked them, first of all, to read scripted material. And the scripted material was um, scripts that I wrote from affirmation websites, which are, um, you know, the tone of that material was very, well, to me, facetious. I, I found it, you know, very insincere. And um, the second thing that I asked them to do was to make their own script and to answer this question and to, to read that answer in the second person tense. So to answer that question and to read it to another person. So these are some of the um, some of the scripts that people made, and um, 
So then the material that you encountered when you walked through the museum was very different in tone, sometimes very, you know, sometimes very sincere, sometimes very authentic, sometimes very facetious, and the viewer would have to sort through that. And bringing the private or the ordinary into that elevated space um, oops, was you know, one of my goals for that piece. This is a few of the sites. I'd just like you to know that the about you. You may think it's strange they can care about you and they don't even know your name. I, do. I would like to get to know you better. A fascinating and interesting. A fascinating and interesting. You are a magnet for success. You have unshakable. really good. People like you make this world a pleasure to live in. You're beautiful inside and out. You're effective. You make things happen. I want you to know something. I'm really focused on you. I'm really, like, I really, I really want to listen to you. I really want to know what you have to say. I really care about you. You, yes, 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 you. So um, I'm going back between installations and uh, gallery-based work. So after I did that piece, I wanted to, I was thinking about how to translate some of that experience into an object, into a discrete object, and make something that held uh, that sense of discovery and crossed into personal space the way those the way that installation did um, and this was the piece I made with some of the recordings from that and it's just a wooden box and it uh, has a handle but I, I I like it to have no signage so you don't know whether it can be opened or not but if you do open it then you approach it then with a sense of trepidation and this is the this is the sound in it and the voices ascend in volume so that it becomes increasingly more embarrassing to keep the <laughs> keep the lid open. Um, this is a group of sculptures. These were the first my first group of kinetic works. Actually maybe my only group yet. I'm gonna do some more. Um, and I was trying to make objects that that invoked empathy and also gave empathy. And so kinetics seemed a way to do this, um, to use movement to speak about um, emotional and physical vulnerability and also uh, the body, the frailty of the body. Um, this piece is called Obstacle. I'm showing you two of uh, th 10 of those sculptures. This piece was called Obstacle. 
Here's the detail of the guy, the bag. And it was on a, um, a rotation about once per minute. I originally made the piece on the second hand of a clock, um, but uh, I had to change the motor because it got it was too hard. But um, but so it's that one rotation per minute kind of timing. The scale of that is about this big. So you got a real close up view there. It's not so big. And uh, this piece, this is my most embarrassing piece. <laughs> um, cast concrete blocks are the base. And then um, the top is hearts found hearts. I found them on the ground. Uh, I started when I, I, I now <coughs> over the course, now I just, this piece is just ongoing. I'm still finding them. It's not really 2012, it's actually, it's ongoing because I'm still finding the hearts. And um, each one is, and sometimes people find them for me now, um, each one is attached to the second hand of the clock. So there's clocks inside those blocks that give the hearts movement and so they kind of twitch or tremble um, depending on the weight of the material. They have different ways of twitching. So in this, you know, this kind of flirtation with the sentimental is, I don't know why I feel like I have to do that, but um, <laughs> I, I do. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for something authentic within the cliché. And, um, yeah, looking for that. I am always embarrassed to show that piece. <laughs> um, the next is a group of photographs from 2007 called Placements. And these are... Um, made with a 35 millimeter camera and film, not digital, and um, like this. Uh, camera in this hand, mirror in that hand, to see in front and behind at the same time. This next piece is called Terrain from 2008, a site-specific piece at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And they commissioned me to make a piece for their entry pavilion, which is this huge, well, th about 3,000 square feet space, um, glass on three sides, a marble floor, incredibly resonant space. And um, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be crazy to do a sound piece in here? Because the sound would just bounce all over the place. Um, so I, I got the idea for this piece standing in the woods and having the wind move overhead and having this kind of simultaneous experience of sound and touch. And, uh, and that's what <coughs> I wanted to make is a, a conflation of sound and touch. So the piece is 12 thousands and thousands of feet of wire um, conduct, uh, carrying th thousands of feet of wire, about uh, 208 speakers, 12 zones, T 208 speakers dispersed through 12 zones, and the wire um, is color-coded so you can, uh, so the different zones are distinct. So it's a 16-channel soundtrack that moves through those 12 zones in a choreographed movement. So I, I worked with a um, programmer to make a max patch that would move the sound through the space. 
And the sound, um, as you might have guessed, is voice again. Um, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I'd had these experiences of recording people, and with affirmation, I noticed that sometimes people got, you know, that it was, it, it, sometimes it was a strong experience for them to do these recordings. So I decided to really go for that and to make it a very focused experience, you know, that, that these people I was going to record, um, I really wanted to make it in the recording an experience and see if that would translate into the work, into, you know, to my viewer. Um, so I put, uh, I got about 40, about 40 people to record for this. Always my volunteers are self-selecting. I just, you know, put out the call and whoever wants to comes, comes and says, okay, I'll do this. And um, so I put these, these participants alone in a room with these instructions and they heard their own voice. So um, they heard themselves doing these things. And um, the recordings I got were really very, um, very emotional, and I, you know, people really, seemed like people really um, contacted something personal when they were doing these, and I wanted that to, you know, so I, I used that in the piece, and you couldn't really, um, here, I'm going to play you a little bit of this piece gives you just a taste of the sound, but it was a 22-minute soundtrack with six sections and, you know, 16 channels, so the feel of it was very much more physical, very, very physical. And you couldn't really, you couldn't hear the distinct words. I mean, occasionally you could pick up a word here and there, but mostly you heard the affect of the words and then all these other kind of human all these other sounds, the breathing, the humming, whistling. This next piece is uh, called The Sound of Light, and it was a site-specific piece at the Jewish Museum here in New York. And uh, these are, this is a receiver, and that's what I called it, the receiver. And it does receive, it's got a, a radio in it, and it receives signal, and it glows, and I was, you know, I you know, went through a lot of permutations sculpting this object for the, for the mold and um, really wanted to make something that felt a little bit dangerous, but also something that you wanted to take care of or something that compelled you to hold it. And I made 50 of them, and then, and these could be borrowed by visitors to, um, 
to the museum and held as they walked through the exhibit. So the piece was cited, I chose the site of the, um, the permanent exhibit in the museum is on the top two floors and it's, it's kind of, to me it felt a little dusty up there, like it hadn't been changed in a long time. And um, I cited my piece on top of that permanent exhibit. So it was like a, it was an exhibit on Jewish religion, um, culture, history, and uh, this, you know, the equation was I, uh, you know, I went, I looked around at the objects at the, um, in that specific area. I considered those objects on display and thought of an intangible that maybe they brought to mind. And then I composed a soundtrack to embody or to try and embody that intangible. And I thought of the whole thing as an overlay you know, overlay the ineffable on top of the didactic. So um, my, I made these signs like that, um, which were the names of each of the compositions. Um, so trying to represent intangible with sound. And the, conf and the way I made the sounds were um, eight radio transmitters, transmitting, you know, one, transmitter transmitting one track in a two floor area, eight transmitters, lots of conflicting radio waves. So lots of static and you had to navigate through the static and find areas of clarity. And that's how you, you know, you found the sound by navigating through the static. And when you were standing in front of a sign is when you would be at a, at a clear zone and you would be able to read that the name of that composition. So these are, um, this is a documentation of that, the eight, oops, try again. That says dust, I don't know if you can read that. Every day the boy would come and he would gather her leaves early and eat the crown. Make them eat the crown. And play in the And play in of the cross.
think I forgot to say that the signs were the same as the signs. The d I used the same didactics for my signage as the, um, as the exhibits used. Um, this is, uh, I call this a tapestry. Um, it's eight channels of sound. Those wires, the wires carry eight channels of sound through the 36 speakers. And um, I wanted it to reference a painting, but uh, at a scale that could um, kind of ad address or engulf the viewer's body. This is, it's a 12, 12 minute soundtrack. And this is um, a minute or so of it. And I used, um, basically at this point, I have now a library of sounds from all my pieces. So I just used, um, kind of bits of hundreds of sounds to make this track. Um, another series of photographs, and these, um, all of these were taken in very close vicinity to my home, mostly in my backyard, uh, and the it's a droplet on the edge of my finger, or sometimes multiple droplets. Uh, the drop used as a lens to frame my family and my, my immediate, my kind of immediate environment. And these were taken with a digital camera because I had to take so many to get the, um, to find the images. Um, but no manipulation. But probably, I, I probably took a thousand images to get the series of, mayb of uh, I think there's 16. This next piece is called Digital Empathy from 2011, and it was a piece on the High Line. Did anyone see it? You, you guys saw it? Um, it was broken a lot. I mean, well, the fountains were broken. No, not the fountains. The bathrooms were broken sometimes, um, unfortunately. But soap got stuck in the sinks. Anyway, um, site-specific project, and it was you know, again using the fixtures of the park as a um, as the site, as the objects, and so I made the signage to mark the sites. And there were, um, I used all the elevators, bathrooms, and fountains in the park. And that was the signage. And used synthesized voices to create informational messages. And uh, kind of enacting uh, PSAs or commercials or something you might expect to hear in public space. Hello. We seek to provide every opportunity for superlative cleanliness. However, we prefer you do not use this thing for shaving, trimming, or tweezing. And we strictly prohibit the use of chemical depilatories. Do you know that certain cultures relate hair removal to paranormal activity? So the slip, I was um, very much thinking about slippage and how, you know, something <coughs> you expect could slip into different territory and where were you, you know, where did you orient yourself? Then here's another. Hi, I can give you my complete assurance that you are safe here. You are safe here! Everything <laughs> is running smoothly. However, 
Life is filled with unanticipated potential hazards, obstacles, uncertainties, potential damage, mm -hmm. reputational risk, possible failures, misunderstandings, cause for alarm, snacks and thin ice, and of course, embarrassment. Embarrassment! As you enjoy your leisure time here on the High Line, mm -hmm. play it safe. Play it safe! Have a great day. Have a great day! So the, um, I figured out um, how to get the sound to come out when you push the water, so you get water and sound. Um, elevators, <coughs> so the elevators function differently than the sinks and the um, fountains, because the sinks and fountains were more like these uh, informational messages and then the elevators in each one, each elevator played a song. And so as in the previous elevator piece, I did want to create a social space in the elevator. But, and I did again use uh, pop songs from pre-digital time. But um, the piece was less about, it's not really about lost idealism as the other one was as much of kind of an embodiment of the digital influence just embodiment of, of the digital entity. Here's one. Let, Let us be there in your morning. Let us be there in your morning. Let me be there in your night. Let us be there in your night. Let us change whichever is wrong and make it right. We'll make it right. We'll make it right. Let us ease all of your worries. Correct, assist, repair, support, restore, sustain, facilitate, improve. All we ask you is let us be there. All we ask you is let us be there. All we ask you is let us be there. All we ask you is let us be there. All we ask you is let us be there. Whenever you feel you need friends to lean on, here we are. Um, this one, this was another elevator. Give you a whole lot of love. I don't want more. Give you a whole lot of love. You've got to depend on me, baby. Yeah. LOL. LQTM. Love. 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 So this one, I thought this one was funny because they asked me to change the words. That oops, I wanted to play this one clip. Well, they asked. I had to change the words because they were too, um, you know, suggestive. Uh, let's see. So, the last couple years, I've been. Um, doing a show that's like a survey show and I did it in a few institutions and have had to reinstall or have had the opportunity to reinstall these pieces that I never thought would be reinstalled. So um, this is how deep is your uh, installed um, in 2012 and then it was installed again um, just a few weeks ago. And this is, oops, I'm missing some slides. This is another piece. Um, gosh, I'm missing the slides from this. Sorry. I don't have the overview, but it's a piece that occurs in between two, it's in inside a wall. So I um, go inside a wall and make a configuration and then use lenses and mirrors to show that configuration on the outside of the wall. So it's a continuous line drawing from outside the wall that travels inside the wall and back out. And sometimes you see the interior and sometimes not. And it's, um, it's all created space. So that's, it looks like you're looking in, but you're actually looking up. And then these are um, a series of sculptures I did called Stability Studies a couple years ago. Um, and this is two from a series of six. And these investigated uh, 
seeking st stability through precariousness. So making something that was so precarious and trying to find the stability within that. Um, so this is a table, three-legged table. This is the fourth leg up there. And the table stands because of the weight of the rock. And then on that rock is balanced a st uh, steel wire. And then that wire um, reaches to the top but doesn't touch. It's suspended there. Um, because there's a magnet inside the wood that keeps it suspended. Um, this stability study is also, also uses a magnet and um, suspends this long wire, about um, eight, eight foot wire, which sits, the sharpened tip of it sits on this glass. And um, this piece is called Composition for a Thin Membrane, also 2012. And it's handmade paper with uh, cast inside the paper is transducers and live wires. So it makes the entire form into a, s a speaker. But actually, it's four channels. So it's like a, the form becomes four channels of sound. And uh, the surface kind of moves with the sound palpitates a bit with the sound. And all the sound is, um, let's see, did we get some sound? Oops. Can't get that sound. There it is. Oops. The sound is all um, sounds of tactile contact between materials. It's like um, that's the sound of a finger over um, uh, crystal layered uh, with a, um, like the t finger over crystal layered with a, like the tone of a string. Sounds of vibration, tones. This last piece I'm going to show you is um, this. Uh, I thought it made sense to end with something that was very kind of the opposite of the first one I showed you. Um, in some ways, opposite. It's very heavy versus light, uh, private versus public, metaphoric versus literal. Um, this is I. This is my only self-portrait. And it's also a portrait of those closest to me. So this is um, a portrait of my daughter. And it's her height. Well, it, w it was her height at that time. Her height and um, dimensions of her body. And then this is me. And this is uh, my husband, Ken. And the blocks are all cast. Um, I cast them, made molds and cast each one. And you know, some of them were distressed and different, different processes to make all the blocks. And it's uh, different kinds of cement, um, dark Portland, white Portland, and also mica. So they have some, some of the blocks have some um, kind of uh, sparkle to them. And inside the blocks are cavities. And there's 143 clocks in the three figures. So I think uh, this, th the big one has 70 something clocks in it. So the, the clocks are ticking, but they're muffled inside the concrete. So you hear a muffled but insistent kind of ticking sound that I have not been able to record, so I don't have a sample for you. And, um, and there it is. That's the lecture. Thank you. <laughs> and um, I'm actually better with questions than I am with the lecture, because <laughs> I don't know, just something about sitting here giving a lecture is hard. But I'm very open to questions if you have some.
No, that it's actually there's cavities in the blocks, mm -hmm. so the clocks are in there, and then you the batteries, you know, you can ch you have to change them yeah. about once a once a year, or once every couple years. Yeah. The idea that you open that box and you're vulnerable, and then the longer you keep it open. It's almost like there's a stake to, to you hear the I love you's and then there's, you, there's a, there's some, you, you have to make yourself more vulnerable the longer you hear that. It gets loud enough to embarrass, it's embarrassing. <laughs> it, there's a woman who screams, I love you, really loud and kind of, you know, yeah, it gets a little loud, but, um, but just that, you know, I talked about wanting a certain kind of investment from my viewer. So, you know, it's like, how long are you going to do this? How long are you going to keep that lid open? And, and then it goes back. After, if you go through the loudness, it gets soft again. So it's a cycle. Well, the piece was developed when I figured out that that was my site. I, um, I had about two months to go, you know, to interact with the residents of the hotel and discuss some ideas. And this was one of the ideas I proposed. And people were, the, you know, they were pretty into it. I mean, some men, I would say no one was against it. And some were, you know, didn't really care. And some were really into it. So, um, there was that element, but really if you were in the room, you could kind of hear it, but it was over there and it was, it was like a phone ringing. And if you, you know, if you don't answer the phone, it just stops ringing. Mm -hmm. So it, did, it didn't feel, um, I didn't get the sense from them that it was invasive. And in fact, the, um, that visibility was something that some of those men hadn't really experienced. Like um, the man who became most engaged with that piece, I mean, really engaged with it, uh, he would wait, you know, he would wait for someone to call. And um, he, I, th I think that, you know, he'd spent a number of years not, you know, people didn't, didn't speak, you know, didn't, didn't approach him. And uh, so there was, you know, there was both, there was that aspect too. Um, but the, I would say, you know, that I, I didn't, I was very, I tried to be very conscious of this being in their space. And it was a space that was a, it was a public space. I mean, that's, that was very important to me that that was their public space, not their private space. Like if they really, if they wanted to be alone, that wasn't the space that they went to to be alone. There was an after, um, actually a very interesting thing that happened with that piece is that well, got, it got a lot of press, and there was some, uh, there was this thing in the New Yorker, like a cartoon of how it worked, like a cartoon of someone on the street and someone in the um, hotel. And that kind of made this big, um, I was, I and the museum was contacted by a, um, like a housing rights organization, and there was a big uproar and this piece, um, it, you know, it's, it takes advantage of these men. And we had a public, you know, we kind of called a meeting with them. And, and then we walked them over to kind of experience the piece rather than just see the cartoon of it. And they ended up having a very different read on it. And then, you know, talking to the men. And, and it ended up actually that that organization help those men to, um, to receive a settlement because, of course, they were dislocated, you know, within a year. 
and um, they did they did receive a settlement each one mm -hmm. because you know there was some vi the visibility actually was you know it it, it was helpful to them um, that color uh, well when I thought about that piece you know the piece started with the songs and then I thought about what color would make sense to transmit those songs and that color came I mean well, it, it was, it's a combi I basically looked at my palette of industrial colors. Like, I wanted to use industrial materials. The PVC I could paint, but the tubing, you know, the soft, the uh, uh, corrugated tubing had to come made. And so I looked at my palette of industrial materials and said, oh my gosh, that's secret blue, like secret deodorant circa <laughs> 1980, whatever, five. And um, so that, so that blue made sense, not just because it was secret blue, but because <laughs> it was, it seemed like a color that made sense with those, with those songs and what I was trying to reference, which was a kind of, um, a certain period in a certain period in my life and maybe something that could be referenced by other people. Um, I, uh, yes, the, you know, I would get a, a site that said, you know, I, <coughs> uh, we want to commission you to do something. So I would go to the site and I would look around and look for the things that stood out for that site as a, um, where I thought I could intervene there. Like, what was it about that site that I could call attention to? or um, make some reversal happen, or, you know, what, what was it about that site? So it's very, all of those site-specific pieces are very integrated. You know, the, the decisions for what to make are very integrated with those places. So, um, for example, with terrain, in, you know, I wanted to use the acoustics of that space and also the height of the space and the, the expanse. So that was very physically kind of motivated. And then the Tate Liverpool, that was, you know, I kind of um, was going off of the, um, there was a kind of tightness there that I wanted to disrupt. And um, like the Jewish Museum piece, as I said, you know, I went up to those third and fourth floors and it just felt like needed some, I don't know, some air or something. Like another, it needed a, when another layer and then the, you know, so every piece has its, its need, basically. Um, some pieces, I would say minimum a year. Some pieces take two. I think the fastest piece in all of those site-specific ones you saw was um, terrain, and that took, uh, well, that took almost a year also, about a year, generally. The using the computer voices in those pieces allowed me to put attention to the words that you don't have, like those those peace anthems, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you hear them in the supermarket. You don't, you don't, I mean, you, you just hear them and they don't mean anything. Or to me, it's they... It's like Dwayne Reed music. Yeah, it's Dwayne yeah. Reed music. Yeah. And then if you, so, so the computer voices was a way for me to, um, like, hear them. And it's that, di you know, the dichotomy of... The computer is this inanimate thing, but trying to give it um, affect, and that it doesn't fit, you know, and and it's that not fitting is where it becomes new, you know. Um, and there's a you know digital empathy. I got really good at making those computer computer voices have um, 
have bodies almost, like have them, you know, to really embody those things, to reach for, to reach for bodies. Um, and they still, I don't know, they, they reached, but, but I, f I mean, I don't know, I don't know. It's like that's, that's that place that I'm, I was kind of trying for. Like the reaching, in, in the reaching, and you know it's not going to ever have a body. You know, it's, n it's never going to be human. And so that's a place to get some newness. Um, the drawing is actually a very big part of my process. And for every, um, when I would make those big, the, the, the big installation pieces that take a year, I, ooh, um, I have a notebook. I mean, you know, I have a, a sketchbook dedicated to the piece. So all my sketches, all my ideas go into there. So the, I mean, I don't, I'm not a good drawer. I, I can't draw, but I, I can't draw, I can't render, but I draw to um, move my thought process for sure. And a lot of drawing and a lot of writing. Yeah. So not drawing, that's a public drawing, but a very private yeah. and uh, fertile drawing practice. And then the tech stuff, I learn it. I mean, I know I, I learn it, you know, the pieces have taught me, like I learn if I, wa I think about this effect or what I want to make happen, and then I learn how to do it. And, some, and then I get help if I need to. If it's be, you know, it's something I can do. It's something that I can speak about very authentically. And um, it, it feels um, potent to do that. And it feels, you know, it, I, so, some, I would really like to make some, I would like to make, sometimes I would really like to make very potent uh, politi political work and uh, work that could have an effect in the world. And it's not my, you know, that kind of, in some ways, speaking about intimacy or speaking about a, um, you know, a, like a more lower, not lower, but a smaller scale intimacy is a way that I can, you know, I feel like I can address that, that, because um, it's just, you know, that's, it's what I can do. Yeah. Uh, I feel like there's more to answer there, but but I don't have I don't have something right now. Well, the conversations, you know, it was really interesting when I was thinking about how to try and document this piece. I did sort of make some. I mean, hardly any, but I started to make some attempts to document some conversations and it just felt really wrong like that was something that was not mine right. and um, and so the conversations I don't know the conversations the ones I overheard were not very interest I mean you know they were like can you hear me <laughs> yes <laughs> what's your name you know like kind of silly no, but just, but it, but you know, there was always laughing and there was always, it was exchange, but I wouldn't say that it was deep exchange, not in the content of the words, you know. Um, but just, I mean, to me, the convert, it was more about a space for that to happen. So it wasn't the conversations per se, it was the space for them to occur. Well, I don't know. There was a stool around that they, you know, if someone wanted to bring it over, they could 
There was a, st I remember, I actually, re I re brought a stool from my studio. I remember that. I hadn't remembered until you mentioned that, but um, I brought a stool over from my studio, a tall stool, because you know it had to be mm -hmm. up at the height of the mouth of the tube, but nobody used it. So yeah. it, was an, it was like against the wall. Is that it? Yay, I'm done. <laughs>